to wrap up our discussion of basics, I want to dive a little bit more into some of the details going on with simple and reflexivity. We've seen some maybe mysterious behavior with those in earlier bits of the chapter as to when simple behaves in a particular way, when it does actually simplify, what reflexivity can do versus can't do compared to simple. Let's figure that out a little bit better. I should say in advance that this is going to dive a little bit more into some theoretical programming languages material that is not explained in the textbook and that I won't have a lot of time to dive into here myself. I may have to gloss over some bits of it, but I hope it gives you a little bit more insight into what's really going on inside of Calk. To begin, let's back up a little bit. We've learned a fair amount of Calk syntax in this basics chapter. It could be a little bit overwhelming at first, but one thing that might help is to start dividing it into your mind into three pieces. In a way, there's really three different languages you're learning all at once when you're learning Cock. And those three languages are the vernacular, Galena, and LTAC. So I've mentioned the vernacular before, that's where files get their .v extension. And these are these capitalized keywords that used to give commands to sort of change what Cock is doing. Uh, you can say check in order to tell it to run a command to type check something. You can say theorem to state a theorem and then to later on enter proof mode and then fit later on after that finish your proof mode with QED. Right? So these are kind of the large level building blocks of, of how we interact with Cock. Diving down a bit though is Galena. Galena is the functional programming language and logic, it's possible to look at it both ways, that is uh, built into Cock that we've been using to write code with and state theorems with. So when we wrote code, for example, to implement negation of a Boolean or the less than equal to function on Booleans or the even function on natural numbers, all of that, we were writing code in Galena. Uh, so that includes things like match expressions, if expressions, uh, the for all quantifier, even in the theorems that we were stating, like uh, that, that neg b was an involution for all b, uh, neg b, neg b, b equals b, right? So that is a piece of the, the syntax that we use for writing down both logical statements and programs. There is a deep sense in which uh, the notion of types of programs and formulas that we're writing down in logic are really quite quite much the same thing. Uh, and so it's not surprising if you know that, that there should be a similar syntax for both of them. That's why Galen Galena unifies them. We'll dive into this much later in a chapter titled Proof Objects. Uh, the third piece of syntax we've been learning uh, is LTAC, the language for tactics that is built into Cock. Uh, and we've only seen a little bit of this so far. Uh, we've seen some tactics like intros, simple, reflexivity, and destruct. Uh, by the way, we've also seen bullets. That would be another example of LTAC, how we're structuring our proof into sections. Uh, curly braces would fall into that as well. Okay, so you might have the feeling that uh, it's just sort of like random tactics go or button mashing on your video game controller at this point when you're using things like simple and reflexivity and rewrite. Uh, in fact, uh, a student in one of my classes made this meme last semester to explain how they felt about uh, using tactics at about this time. Okay, so we all feel this way when we first start learning cock. I want to try to peel back uh, the curtain a little bit on what's going on though. To do that, I'm going to need to talk a little bit about lambda calculus. Lambda calculus is the, th the theoretical underpinnings of functional programming. Uh, in a similar way, I guess, to Turing machines are sort of the theoretical foundations of imperative programming, if you will. Uh, lambda calculus is just the super simplest functional programming language that exists. Uh, I'm not saying that you want to write programs in it, but it works as an explanation for functional programming. Uh, in the lambda calculus, uh, you have expressions E, which can be exactly one of three forms. So it's very minimal. Uh, either you've got a identifier X or you've got a anonymous function. So this is a function that does not have a name. We're not binding any names here. Uh, an anonymous function is written lambda X dot E. Uh, this is where the lambda calculus gets its name. Uh, lambda here just says what's following is an anonymous function. X is the identifier here that is the input to the function. And E is another expression uh, that's going to be evaluated and will be the result, uh, the output of the function. Okay, so we've got identifiers and functions. And finally, we have function application. So just writing two expressions next to each other, E1 applied to E2, uh, which is actually what we've been using uh, in Cock as well. 
Okay, so that's all you need for the lambda calculus. Uh, it turns out this is uh, complete. You can write any program that you want in this language. Uh, it just may not be enjoyable to do so because it's so small. All right. Without diving into all the other fun technical things we could talk about about lambda calculus, what we need to know for understanding cock tactics right now is about two notions of uh, equivalence and reduction. So the first is called alpha equivalence. Alpha equivalence says names don't matter. Names are irrelevant. As long as you consistently name a variable the same thing every place you want to use it, you're fine. You could rename it something else later on if you want. Right? So whether or not you call the input to the neg b function b or foo or bar or whatever you want, as long as you use it consistently, you say foo every time, you say bar every time, or you say b every time, it means the same function. So that's the notion of alpha equivalence in the lambda calculus. OK. The other thing we need to know about is beta reduction. Beta reduction is the computational model, if you will, for the lambda calculus. It is how you do function application and substitute the value being passed in for an input uh, as part of evaluating a function's body. OK. There's a lot we could talk about with beta reduction as well, but just think about it in that way. It's like applying a function to its input to get an output. Now, the way that you do that, as it turns out, has some technical subtleties to it. And unfortunately, we do need to get into those. Uh, if you have functions that could be applied to arguments, um, the question arises, if that argument is like a big complicated expression, like maybe it's 1 plus 1 plus 2, right? Do you need to evaluate all that, that all the way down to 4 before passing that argument into the function? Hmm. I mean, you, you might think of doing it that way um, if you've programmed in many functional languages. Uh, in some other functional languages, if you've programmed into them, you might think, oh, no, I don't need to do that evaluation first. I could wait till later to do it until, you know, maybe maybe wh whether I know that I need the result of that function argument or not. Yeah, I could maybe skip over some unnecessary work if I don't have to do that evaluation. Okay, so what I'm getting at here uh, is the notion of call by value versus call by name. Uh, in call by value beta reduction, uh, we don't reduce the application of a function to its argument. Uh, until we've already reduced the argument to a value. So we have to compute that 1 plus 1 plus 2, whatever I said before, down to a 4 before we do the function application. With call by name, we can reduce the application before reducing the argument to a value. And you can imagine like uh, your own crazy programming language, uh, maybe in which you mix and match these, and you can do them in any order. Uh, this is called full beta reduction. This allows you to choose at which time you do any of the applications uh, around any time, anywhere. OK, so uh, reviewing. Beta reduction is about application of functions to arguments. Once you identify that, you have the choice to make as to whether or when you have to evaluate a, an argument to a value before applying the function. Uh, and there are various strategies for that. OK, that's what we need to know about the lambda calculus. One property that can uh, you can think about when uh, you're dealing with these notions of strategies for beta reduction is whether it makes a difference which order you do the evaluations in. Like maybe you start off evaluating an expression E and there's two different orders you could choose to evaluate it in. Uh, maybe those produce two different expressions, E1 and E2. Uh, it might be nice if no matter which order you picked, eventually they got back around to the same expression after you did enough evaluation of them. Like they, they boiled down to the same thing, E prime. Uh, if that's always the case for the reduction strategies that you're using, uh, then the language satisfies a property called confluence. Like it's like a river might flow apart for a while, but then come back together. Right? That's the notion of confluence here. OK, so with that established as a concept as well, here's what these tactics are doing. Uh, simple, the tactic that we've used so far in basics, is trying to make smart, human-readable choices about reductions. It's trying to reduce the application of a function to its arguments in a way that leaves the entire expression when it's done something that it thinks is going to be easily or at least mildly well read by a human. Right? Instead of trying to produce really big, complicated results of applying functions to arguments that maybe expand into really long expressions that a human might have trouble with. Okay, So simple is trying to do something that's optimized for you and me, which is why it's maybe a little hard to explain exactly what it does. Nonetheless, I'm going to try. Before I do that, let me point out that there are 
at least two other alternatives to simple in terms of trying to reduce an expression down to a, uh, a final value. Um, and those are CBN and CBV, uh, which uh, stand for call by name and call by value. Uh, although making too literal of a comparison of those to the reduction strategies I talked about with lambda calculus is maybe going too far. Uh, but CBN is trying to do something like call by name. Uh, it's newer than simple. There are some people who say that it's even smarter about the choices that it makes. Uh, you can give it a try. If simple's not working for you someday, maybe try CBN and see if it does something more reasonable for you. CBV is trying to fully compute. It's trying to get down to that bottom of that confluence, like do all of the applications that it could possibly do and end up with a final uh, result. That final result might be very big if you're dealing with big programs. We haven't dealt with big programs yet, but if you're dealing with big programs, it might get very big. It might be hard for you to read at that point. Okay, but it's trying to do every single application that's possible. So we've got simple CBN and CBV. We've also talked about reflexivity already, and we've seen sometimes that it seems like it overlaps with simple. Okay, so what is reflexivity doing? I can finally explain that to you. Reflexivity is, of course, trying to finish a proof by reflexivity of equality, that notion of equals uh, being reflexive. And what it's actually doing is if you want to prove that E1 equals E2, and you use the reflexivity tactic, reflexivity as a tactic is going to fully reduce E1 and E2. It's going to fully compute with them uh, like CBV would do. And then it's going to check whether the results are alpha equivalent whether they are the same expressions up to consistent renaming of variables, of identifiers. If so, then reflexivity has succeeded as a tactic. It solves that goal for you, and it will tell you. Otherwise, it's going to fail. Okay, I'm actually glossing over one tiny technical detail about other ways it can, uh, one other way it can succeed uh, in, in another kind of equivalence. But uh, if, if you really want to know about that, read the manual entry for reflex reflexivity. Okay, this is why it's never necessary to do a simple before a reflexivity. Why? Because simple is trying to do some reductions. It's trying to be smart about which reductions it chooses. It's trying to only do those that's going to leave uh, an expression that's human readable. But reflexivity is just going to bring like the big hammer to it. It's going to be like, no, I'm doing all the reductions all at once here, and then I'm just going to compare for alpha equivalence. Okay. So that is why you never actually need to do a simple before reflexivity as far as like satisfying cock with the proof. On the other hand, it may help you as a human to do a simple first, because then you'll get to a place where an expression is more readable to you. Uh, maybe you didn't even realize that like the two sides of the equals were the same thing uh, or were going to be the same thing eventually. You needed to see the simple as a human to figure that out. We humans are simple, I guess, that way. Okay, so that's reflexivity. Now, to explain what simple is doing, we need to know a little bit more about Galena. Because Galena is more than just the lambda calculus. Right? The lambda calculus is a very primitive functional programming language, but Galena is a much bigger, uh, hopefully nicer one, in which you would want to write more code. Galena adds a lot of things to the lambda calculus. Uh, but for now, what I need to tell you about is the kinds of reductions it adds. OK, so remember before we had beta reduction, which is the application of a function to its argument. Galena is going to add three other kinds of reductions that I need to tell you about. First off, it adds delta reduction. Think of the mnemonic here, uh, the D in delta, as being for definitions. We've had definitions, right? Like a definition of the even function or of the plus function. OK, um, a definition here, when I actually use the keyword capital D definition, uh, introduces a name that is bound to some expression, some value. Maybe it's a function, maybe it's just a very simple value. Delta reduction is the process during computation of replacing a name to the value it was bound to by that definition. Okay. Uh, so this is something that goes on all the time. You probably don't even think about it, but it is a separate step of computation if you want to piece it apart like that. All right. Galena also adds iota reductions. Uh, these are for inductive types. So the, uh, the mnemonic there would be the I in iota is the same as the I in inductive. Okay, so iota reductions are about doing pattern matching and recursion. 
So we've written those kinds of functions already, right? We've written pattern matching where we pattern match against a value of an inductive type and then do one thing for each of the different constructors of it. Uh, we've also seen recursive calls. Those recursive calls have been underneath a pattern match. Uh, we've used that pattern match to extract some smaller piece of a data, uh, of a piece of data, and then done a, re done a recursive call on it. Okay, so actually recursive calls, those kinds of function applications are handled differently than non-recursive function applications, uh, which maybe is another reason why it might be useful for you to think about the difference in the vernacular between capital D definition and capital F fixed point for those. All right, so that's iota reduction. It's for uh, these inductive types and values and computations on those. Uh, and finally, let bindings. Now we haven't talked about these. If you happen to know about them from other functional programming languages, uh, you can say, you know, like let some name equal some other expression. We'll eventually come across this in software foundations as well. Uh, but these are called zeta reductions. Let's let's not dig deeply into those right now. As it turns out, the CBV tactic takes flags that can selectively enable each of these kinds of reductions. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and play around with this on your own, uh, you can come up with examples and just do CBV iota on it or CBV delta on it to see what each of these reductions is doing individually. Uh, for more about that, see this entry on CBV in the cock manual. The compute vernacular command, uh, in fact, does a CBV with all of the reductions enabled. So it's doing beta, delta, iota, and zeta all together. Okay, so that's all of the reductions that Galena has that it adds on top of beta reductions from the lambda calculus. Now that we know about those, let's talk about one other technical concept. Stay with me here. Let's talk about convertibility. Two expressions, E1 and E2, are convertible, or another phrase for that is definitionally equal, if they fully reduce to alpha equivalent terms. Okay, so fully reduce here means that You've enabled all four of those uh, kinds of reductions, beta, delta, iota, and zeta. Uh, and we know what alpha equivalent means. It means the same up to renaming consistently. OK, so if two expressions, if you fully reduce them with all of the reductions enabled, and you get something alpha equivalent, they're convertible. And that is exactly what the notion of equals means that we've been using so far in Coq. Two expressions are equal if they are definitionally equal, if they are convertible. And that's really what we've been doing when we massage our uh, goal in our proof state. So we've been trying to simplify it, change it, do case analysis, whatever, to get to a point where we can convince Koch that in fact both sides of it are convertible to one another, that they are definitionally equal. It, as it turns out, convertibility is decidable in Koch because Galena has the property of being strongly normalizing. Uh, it doesn't go off into infinite loops. It doesn't uh, have non-termination as a possibility. Uh, that's something we'll explore a little bit more as we get further into software foundations. But this is exactly what reflexivity, you can think of it as doing. Uh, reflexivity is deciding whether two terms are convertible to one another. Uh, and that's why it's always able to succeed or fail on the, on the uh, goal that you're able to give it. OK, now we can talk about simple at long last. OK, what does simple do that's smart? Roughly speaking, this is cl as close as I can get with what we have covered so far. Simple does a full reduction of the goal that it's working on except that it won't reduce sometimes because it thinks it would make the term too complicated for a human. Which is to say, it won't delta reduce unless an iota reduction is immediately triggered. Okay, so uh, if you can remember what delta and iota mean, uh, that's great. Uh, if not, here's a rough paraphrase of what I just said. Simple does full reduction, except names won't be expanded to their full definition unless doing so causes a pattern match to simplify. Why? Because in general, perhaps, uh, expanding a name might produce something, you know, might change something that's very small, a very short identifier, to a very complicated expression that it was defined to be. Simple is going to refuse to do that unless a pattern match will immediately simplify right after that, right? Which means there's a hope, therefore, that you've made progress on understanding what the expression really means. Okay. There's one other piece to this, though, which is, as I mentioned earlier, 
reduction of a recursive function call or function application is actually considered to be an iota reduction, not a delta reduction. Sorry, not a beta reduction. Right? It's iota because it's about an inductive type. You're doing a recursive call on that inductive type or on a value of that inductive type. Okay, so going back to this again, uh, simple does full reduction, except it won't delta reduce unless an iota reduction is immediately triggered. Specifically, what that means for recursive functions is uh, a recursive function application uh, is not, not going to be expanded. You're not going to expand the, like the, the name of that function there to its definition, unless doing so actually causes that function application to simplify. Okay. So now if you go back to places where you thought maybe simple was going to work and it didn't do anything for you, uh, it's generally going to be because one of these two things got violated. Uh, either it required you to expand, expand a recursive function, but actually that didn't cause anything to simplify. So simple was like, nope, not going to do that. Or uh, simple didn't do what you thought it was going to do because expanding a name didn't cause a pattern match to immediately simplify. In which case it was like, nope, I'm not going to do that. I think that would just make the expression more complicated rather than easier for a human to read. Uh, you can put this to work uh, in some of the exercises that you're trying in, in Software Foundations, if you wish. Or if you want, you can just ignore this entire discussion. Uh, it won't come at up too much more in Software Foundations. It's really for those who want to have a little bit better understanding of exactly what's going on with these tactics.